Maria Elizabeth is the owner, founder, and behind the chair stylist at Salon Design, which is in Alexandria, Virginia, where their motto is empower people to discover, create, and recreate who they are. Today, we're going to hear about her story, how she got to where she was, how she opened her salon, and what they're all about. Welcome back to the Hairdresser Strong Show. My name is Robert Hughes, and I'm your host. And today, I'm with Maria. How are you today, Maria? I'm good, Robert. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, as a as a DC a DMV native and DC uh, salon stylist, and uh, and I'm working with like the local local students. Um, I always like getting uh, my local salon owners on. So I'm looking forward to hearing about you, your journey and how you got there. And I know that a lot of rising stylists, when I visit the schools, they want to hear about how people built a brand, how people built their business. And, uh, what I want to make sure that we touch on in these stories is not just the steps you took necessarily, but how you handled them and managed them along the way. I think that there's uh that we need to make sure to let people know that there are a lot of there's a lot of work there's a lot of steps and it comes with a toll mentally and physically and um hearing about like how people how how you dealt with it and overcame it i think is so so valuable to kind of remind people that it's not just about being able to put that that sign up and saying i'm an owner or i'm a entrepreneur it's like okay in order to get that put that up there and say that like what is behind it and what and you know what is underneath of it so um with that said, please like give us a little intro. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about how you, how and why you got into the industry, and 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 talk about the steps that you took to become a salon owner. Sure. Yeah. So um, I from Michigan originally, uh, farm girl, farm girl first, and um, I I was just in in general drawn to the beauty industry. Um, I didn't even at the time know that there was an industry for it. Um, I was homeschooled and so had really limited um, world experience, um, so to speak. And I would on occasion get out uh, to go to the library, which was a big outing. And I loved watching or like checking out the Vogue magazines and 17 and all of that kind of stuff. And um, really just thought it was cool. And I heard a commercial one day um, for this cosmetology school. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this could be a job. Like that sounds amazing. Like I want to do that. And so, um, I, I, when I was in the basement, went upstairs, told my mom, I'm like, Hey, you know what? This is what I want to do with my life. And she was like, no, that is not going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. You'll be a beauty school dropout. I mean, the whole, every, you know, all of that. So, um, but I was, I was pretty adamant. I was, you know, going to be like, this is what I want to do. And so, uh, since I was homeschooled, I was able to dual enroll and I did the um, training at the height, like through the high school, um, got my license. And um, as I was going through school, I, I felt like very, very passionate about the, the whole industry and wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. So um, put myself through advanced training while I was still in school modeled at all the hair shows. Um, so I, you know, put myself in the room with these tremendous educators, um, made some good friends and, um, ultimately landed at a salon in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Philip Anthony salon. And uh, they, they gave me training after, um, I got out of the cosmetology school. So I trained with them. I think it was about a year. Um, you know, they would teach, you know, from haircuts, I assisted with them, you know, I did shampoos, um, really got, you know, the, the knowledge of how to be a stylist in a successful salon and, you know, how to handle all kinds of different types of clients and, and all of that. And, um, I had visited the DC area before, um, when I was like 16, 17, something like that. And, had always been like drawn to it. And I, I made a promise to myself I was actually at the Kennedy center. And I was like, you know what, when I grow up, I'm going to move here and live here. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, so when I was 20, there was a salon in old town, Alexandria that, um, 
had a, a position open and I sent a resume to them, you know, not knowing I'm, you know, from out of state, I have no clients, but I felt pretty confident that I would be able to like come in and crush it. And, um, they gave me an interview and the, uh, the owner there gave me a job, which was awesome and helped me, you know, just kind of launch my career. So I was there for about four years and I, I was, you know, I killed it right out of the gate. To be honest, right. I was like, fully booked within a year, um, you know, clients wanting to come to me, raising my prices. Um, and I, I was loving it, but I also felt like I wanted a challenge a bit. Um, and though it was a great salon, I felt like there were some areas that, um, you know, I was thinking could be, you know, room for improvement kind of thing. And so, um, I, uh, decided I was just going to like, be like, yeah, like, let's go. I'm going to open up a salon. And there was another stylist there at the time. Um, and she was 10 years older than me. And she's like, have you ever thought about opening a salon? I'm like, kind of, sort of, but I don't really know. And, uh, she's like, we should do it. So there was a, a salon that was for sale in, in old town and we made an offer and, uh, purchased the salon together moved our clients, um, stayed in contact with the old, my old salon, you know, kept a good relationship there, which was really important to me. Um, and you know, they were mentors. And so, uh, opened up salon to then with this other person and right out of the gate realized that that was a really bad choice. Um, I, which part was the bad choice? <laughs> purchasing with someone that you really don't know that well. Gotcha. Um, and, and, and not having, I was younger, right? I'm 24 as I'm opening the salon and she's 34. And I kind of had this in my mind that like, oh, she's older, she's wiser, you know, you got to make exceptions for the older, you know, not make exceptions, but like they're uh, like, they're just, they're better. You're supposed to like acquiesce in a way. Right. And um, I right out of the gate realized that she and I had some really fundamental differences on how to run a business and how we saw a business being run, how to treat employees, um, how I wanted to show up, how I wanted the brand to show up. Um, and this is all as you're, as you know, you're kind of learning as you go. Right. So it's like, you know, coming into the salon, I already had employees, right. Cause I purchased an existing salon. So we made some really poor missteps. Um, integrating ourselves into that culture, um, and, you know, lost some stylists, um, you know, went to a different salon, still friends with them, but it was definitely like a learning curve for me and for her. Um, and then I think it was about, about a year or so in, um, decided that, you know, she, she didn't really want to do any more. Um, this was in 2000, it was 2007 when we opened up. So this was in 2008, right after the recession, like everything, the bubble had burst. Yeah. Um, she didn't want to work anymore. Um, she was, you know, had found somebody else, uh, in Texas that she was now with. And I was like, this is a great opportunity for me to finally like, kind of just like buy her out and become my own brand. Um, and really kind of sort that out. So terrifying. Cause I'm still like, in my early twenties. Um, but I'm like, all right, you know what, I'm going to do this. And so, um, you know, bought her out and, and then from there really started learning how to run a business, um, how to grow a business, how to, you know, have a brand, um, from, you know, taking classes to making a lot of mistakes and learning from them. Um, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, proud we've been in business now for 15 years and, you know, I've learned a lot of uh, how to develop a team, grow a culture, um, and get integrated in the community so that you can have brand awareness with, um, you know, fellow fellow business owners in the area. And we can all like kind of help and support each other um, and grow. And I, I feel like even though I've been in business for 15 years, I am still a novice. I feel like there's so much that I, you know, continue to learn um, and grow and be like, wow, I, you know, would do that differently next time. Um, so that's, uh, you know, how design came into being, so to speak. Nice. I like this story. And then thank you for, uh, the details. Um, I like the details. So I'm curious, um, for those people that are in a, in a salon, uh, working in a salon, they're thinking about leaving to open up their own salon, or they know that that's their pathway. 
You know, maybe they know, maybe, maybe they're not even working on a salon yet, but they are thinking, I want to open my own salon, but I want to start off at a salon to get training experience, build a book, uh, which is, seems to be a pretty popular thing that I'm hearing. Uh, Salon owners aren't very happy to hear that they are being reduced to a a conduit for which these people, these uh, rising stylists can just build their business and take it. (laughs) And so um, what do you, could you speak to that a little bit? Because you said that you left and you had a good relationship with your owner, with the other salon owners and you, and, and you don't have to speak directly to the, to the, to the person who's aspiring to get there. Uh, You can, you don't have to speak to the salon owner that is hiring these people. Um, but you could speak to both or just one or separately, but could you speak on that? Yeah, let me think about how to break that down. So one, I think maintaining relationships is important as, as best you can for as long as you can. Um, so, you know, if you're a stylist like I was at a, at a shop, I would say, you know, those owners, and obviously everybody has different experiences and there's different owners, but if you treat people well and you're like, I was transparent. I was like, look, I, you know, I, I want to do this. Um, and I respect everything that you guys have done. I want to be fair. I wasn't trying to steal any of their, their team members or take any of their shampoo assistants. I was like, this is just me wanting to grow on my own. And, um, you know, they very much respected that. And I think that that is important because later on, there were things that came up that I had questions about being a business owner. And I actually went back to them and was like, hey, look, here's this challenge I've got going on. Like, how should I navigate this? Or how would you navigate it? Um, And so I felt like that was cool to kind of keep that, you know, relationship going. I know it's not always possible. Um, And then to, you know, those stylists that are thinking that it's like, get yourself into some classes on how to learn about actually running a business because it is terrifying, or at least it was for me when I first stepped out and took that initial, you know, like step towards where I wanted to be. It's scary. Um, it was scarier than I anticipated it being. And and I, um, I'm not a person that scares too easily. <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, get, get some classes, really educate yourself. Uh, score is this, um, uh, mentorship in DC. It's in, it's actually all over the place, but in DC and it's free. You can get a mentor. I have one. He has, um, a background. He's a, an executive or was an executive at, um, Exxon Mobil, which is hilarious because we're like so eco-friendly and green in our salon, but he helped me kind of think about business in a different way. I didn't get him until later, but I would recommend anybody that's actually considering launching their own career and business get a mentor. I mean, it, 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 it's beyond helpful, <laughs> you know, just to have that, that person there, um, to have your back and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm terrified of this. How should I be thinking about this? What should I do about this certain thing? Even down to, even if you're, you know, you know, not only, but going into just like a booth rental situation, you know, you are your own business. You are your own brand. Even if you don't have any employees, you still have so much that you have to take care of and so much that you have to think about from taxes to making sure that you are handing your, your clients correctly and you don't get um, in an area where you're going to get sued. You know, I mean, there's like all of those things that you really do need to think about. Bad things can happen. And so you need to make sure that you're kind of heading those off right from the get go. Nice. That's good. Uh, so I love all of that. Uh, I want to set you up on with a with a, uh, a scenario, and I'm curious to know how you. And this is kind of a segue into some other, something else. Uh, if I'm a rising stylist or any rising stylists out there that are listening, and would you say that it's uh, the time to talk to talk about salon being a salon owner is like early on in the application pro, high interviewing process or like at what point in time did you tell your boss that you wanted to go out on your own and what type of time frame from that point to you actually doing it was there it's a great question i think there was about about a year, I think I had worked there for about a year and a half when I first kind of started mentioning, like I was thinking like, this might be something that I want to do. Um, 
and it wasn't like a conversation every day. I think it was, you know, probably just like a casual conversation. And then a couple of months later, you know, another casual um, conversation that kind of folded into to all of that. So, you know, I've hired um, stylists and assistants that have been very open right from the get go, right, that they want that they in their mind, they're thinking, you know, I want to be an owner someday, just like you. And I'm like, hey, you know what, if you want to do that, that's awesome. Good for you. You know, do it the right way. Don't burn bridges you know, like be cool. Don't try to poach like half of the other salon numbers. I think that that's really super tacky. Go build your own brand um, and do your own thing. And if people want to go with you, that's totally cool too. But don't try to like create a toxic environment, you know, like love where you came from and take that and and grow it in a new space. You know, I always think about, you know, that it's, it's really about maintaining those relationships. They're so important to keep it that way. You know, nice. that's good. So, uh, so on that note, uh, can you tell us a little bit about like uh, what it's like to work at Salon Design and what uh, type of person that you're looking for, and kind of give us a little vibe, you know, check right. up. Check check. Yeah, well, so of course it's amazing. It is my my visit, so it's like perfect. No, um, you know, we're very much an inclusive mindset, right? So we welcome tons of diversity. We have every, pretty much every dynamic or every um, demographic um, in the salon. So, you know, from like, you know, people that are more senior that have been in the industry for many years to, you know, people literally just starting out. Um, And so we have very much an inclusive environment. And that doesn't just mean like, you know, welcoming different colors. That means like every single person deserves a seat at the table. Every single person is really important. Their opinion is important. And we value every single person that, you know, works for us. We care about people on um, a level that I think is just slightly beyond what, you know, average work people think, you know, we want to make sure we have a community, like we want to make sure everybody is taken care of, you know, um, and it's, it's a, it can be a stressful job. Um, even though it can be a fun and exciting job, it's also working with the public. And some days, you know, you, you, you need your people around you to give you that like kind of support and, um, you know, push to be like, you know what, you can make it through. I know this person's being kind of a, a pain in the neck right now, but you got this kind of thing. Um, so we're, you know, we're very much like a supportive community and like completely proud of the team that we have. And so when we're looking for people, we want, we want people that won't play nicely with other people. We want people that, you know, take their, their own personal brand very seriously. Um, and then also that it works inside of our brand, right? So I kind of see us, my brand made up of a bunch of individuals that also have their own unique vibe and their own unique brand. And, you know, we want to encourage that and, and foster that, uh, as opposed to being like, okay, everybody in my salon has to be, you know, a tall blonde and that's the only kind of clients that they take, right? It's like, no, we have every single kind of person in the salon and that's how we want to represent with our clients too. We want every single kind of client. We want to be able to take care of them um, because there's a multitude of different people inside the salon that are going to be able to meet their needs. Nice. So if someone, someone's thinking about coming into joining you and uh, what, what are the steps that they should take? So we have on the website, there's a a job link and we have, it's a bunch of different questions and it's like, it's random questions, not just like, oh, you know, how long have you been in the industry and things like that. We're actually trying to get to know you um, and understand like, what makes you tick? What is your passion? Um, You know, why would you be interested in a job at Dizen? Like our our values, also your values, because I think that that's so important, especially, um, this transition that I feel like has been happening over the last probably five, 10 years, but definitely in the last five where consumers want to um, spend their money with brands that have shared values with them. And so we also have to have team members that share those same values. And so it's really making sure that everybody shares the same values and has the same like vision of what they want the world to be. Totally. I love that. So, so so we know where to go and um, what type of expectation should someone have coming out of school or joining with, um, I guess it could be two different expectations, but uh, if it's somebody that doesn't have a clientele, they're new from out of town or they're just getting out of school, uh, what, what kind of expectations should someone have when they join 
assuming that you meet each other and that you like each other and you want to go down this road, like what are, what are the information that someone should know? So we, we, I just had uh, someone who did move from out of town. So came, doesn't have the, you know, but has like lots of experience has been in the industry for many years. Um, and we did, we did just like a little meet and greet um, with, her and the rest of the team so that they could all kind of just like get used to each other, know each other before it's like your first day of work, you know? So, um, and we don't necessarily do that for every single person, but the timing of it just worked out. But what we do usually uh, recommend people do is come in when you're not working, meet everybody there, figure out like where everything, you know, is so that it's a, it's a seamless first day. Um, cause that can be a little bit terrifying, even when you've been in the industry for a while. Um, so we definitely like encourage, encourage that, um, you know, kind of like community building and making sure that everybody knows each other. And it's like an easy, you know, here's the shampoo, you know, this is the girl that's going to be doing the shampoo. Here's where your color is. Um, here's where your foils are. I mean, all of those kind of little micro decisions that you have to know about, um, you know, during your day. Nice. And, and, uh, do you, uh, if you're rising, if a rising stylist is listening, is there like a, uh, you know, any sort of training that they might have to do or how do you, uh, how do how does, how can someone kind of think about getting on the floor straight out of school? Like, what does that process look like? So we have where, um, we, I've had people that have gone through the, like I said, we have, um, an uh, apprenticeship program. Mm-hmm. So we've had it where they've gone through the apprenticeship program and while they're apprenticing and they're doing, you know, shampoos, they're also doing blowouts. They're already kind of like taking clients, so to speak. Um, we, you know, like I said, they're like, they're training with these people all the time. Um, and then they, the Tanisha, she, she just been, a, she just got like immediately onto the floor because we knew we, she had been trained through this whole time. So it's like, I was confident that she could take new clients and I wasn't doing her a disservice by giving her something that she couldn't handle, you know? Um, so we did uh, with her, it was, uh, the training, um, like hands-on essentially, but then also every Monday or every other Monday, depending on schedules, um, we would teach her, um, the steps, you know, of haircutting, coloring, perming, all of those kind of things um, on a level that I would say is more advanced than what a lot of the time people are getting in schools right now. Um, it seems like, you know, I've had um, a few people come through the salon that were assistants that had already had their license, but really didn't get um, the type of training that they needed to make sure that they were ready to hit the ground running, essentially. Um, and so we've taken the time to train them. So they'll take, you know, we kind of assess where their skill is and where they need to develop. Um, and then we'll figure out a, a plan for, for them specifically of like, okay, you know what, we're going to have you take models on Fridays. Um, I work with one of them on a Friday um, and we'll like be like, okay, this is, this is the color. And we're, as we're working together on that client, we talk about, you know, what's the undertone of this level and, you know, thinking about what kind of, you know, tone do you need to put on top of that? Where's your, you know, target at, where do you want to be? And so they're learning, but they're also learning while they're doing it and they're using it. And I feel like people in our industry, actually any industry absorb and maintain and retain that information so much more when it's being used in the moment, as opposed to just textbook. Um, conversations about stuff. So it's very hands-on. So they can expect if, you know, they're, you know, new, they want to get on the floor. Um, You're definitely going to like train with us for a little while. You're going to assist. We've had some people that it's been, you know, six months and they're ready to launch. Um, We have other people that they, you know, wanted a slower pace because that's what felt right to them. And that's where they needed to be. And a lot of it is also like building confidence. You know, some people, it's interesting. Some people come right out of the gate and they're like, I'm not feeling very confident, but their skill set doesn't match that confidence. And then you have people on the other side that are not confident, but they have really great skill sets. And so it's like, you know, where do you need to build that person up? Sometimes it's like developing their confidence and being like, no, you've got this. And other times being like, 
I am totally loving that you've got like this amazing positive energy and you feel really good about this, but I'm seeing that like this area could be tweaked better for you so that you get the results and the client gets the results that you want. And then you're going to develop better and be a stronger hairdresser long-term and get to where you want to be quicker. All right, cool. I love this. It sounds like a tailored approach and it also sounds like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like a lot of support and, uh, and, and a lot of, it sounds, how can I put this, that the community inside the salon is strong, uh, which creates like a support system and uh, you're flexible uh, for moving people up based on their own like uh, confidence and abilities. Yeah. yeah totally. Nice. nice. Yeah. It's a very dynamic uh, approach to it and versatile, which is uh, nice to hear. And I imagine that that is uh, takes a lot of like more hands on uh, approach with your team. Would you say that that's accurate? Yeah, I would definitely. And but it, that's what's also cool. It's like I've got such talented human beings that work there that they are looking out for these other assistants. And they're like, oh, you know what? I can see you kind of like you're really good at, you know, cutting curls. And so let me train you a little bit more and think about that. So it it really does have like a community effect where people really do look out for each other and um, help each other, you know, flourish. Nice. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, Well, I want to dig into some more uh, topics and um, for the audience, when you're listening or watching and uh, you are, you've come to the end here, uh, definitely tune in uh, to the next time. We have Maria on the show. Uh, You're not going to want to miss this. If what did not get mentioned is that uh, Maria in your salon, you use a uh, inclusive pricing model where you don't have gender specific uh, prices. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about like, that's a shift in the industry. And uh, we also did talk a little bit about uh, rising stylists. Uh, What we didn't really get into or touch on is uh, what kind of generational differences you're noticing. And within the context of really any generational difference, but one of those being uh, this um, inclusive pricing model. But and so that's kind of a little teaser for next time. Um, But I like to wrap it up with a laugh and uh, ask each of my guests uh, if they have a scenario that was uh, maybe embarrassing or something that happened like and you weren't didn't think it was funny in the moment but could laugh about it later is there a time that sticks out in your head yeah it's a little gross it's true it's a little gross okay. um, so you know like i said i was raised in michigan on a farm right and like truly couldn't wait to get away from all of that right it was like a gross everything gross right can't wait to be in the beauty industry, right? So fast forward, I own my salon first year, right? I'm just figuring out the lay of the land of everything. And uh, we were in Old Town, Alexandria. There's a bunch of restaurants around. And in the back where we go and dump the garbage, there are just rats like everywhere. And it's like super gross. And so we have, I have like an exterminator dude come out and he's like putting traps up. And I was like, hey, like, but traps only, like don't, um, don't put out poison because I was concerned that they would ingest it and somewhere in the building they would die. Well, guess what? That is exactly what happened. So it is August in Virginia and (laughs) I walk in in the morning and it smells of a dead rat and sure thing. I'm trying to figure out where this darn rat died. And I'm like, this is horrible. I call the exterminator. I'm like, you need to come out here and like, get this rat out. Like it's died dead in my building and it smells. I've got the doors open, air conditioning on, you know, trying to keep the, you know, clients like cool. They're like, what's going on? They're like, oh, there's like something. We're just trying to air it out, you know? <laughs> and uh, the exterminator people will not do anything about it. I call my landlord. He's not going to do anything about it. And so I was like, this is horrible. But what I had to do is we had one of those drop ceilings. And I found out where it was by horribly disgusting maggots falling from the ceiling. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So I had to climb (laughs) up there and dig a dead rat out of my ceiling in my Uh salon. And I was like, you know what? 
I am actually really grateful I was born on a salon, like in <laughs> like in Michigan on a farm because I actually like I'm like all right I can do this I've done some really gross things in my life <laughs> like I couldn't believe it. it was like the furthest from what I thought my life was gonna be like after owning a salon right I was like oh my god I'm in the beauty industry and I'm like here I am like digging out dead rats from my ceiling <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh how long did how many days did that go on for uh, I think that was about two or three days. Two or three days? Yeah. yeah. And it was like, you know, residual. I had, you know, had climbed in, gotten to the insulation. It was horrific. Oh horrific. My but yeah, gosh. it was uh, not funny at the time, but funny later. <laughs> I wonder, you know, they say in this, like, I've heard so many people in the city say, oh, uh, you just got to, it'll go away eventually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's like it's like yeah. so you just the you just gotta wait until it decomposes yeah, completely. Yeah. You're talking like three to five days minimum worth of smell, but then you have the added thing of the maggots falling from the <laughs> Exactly. I was oh. like, oh my god, and it was like right where we had like our hair color processing. So we're like, don't oh, sit over what? there, and we're like trying to sweep away <laughs> the maggots during the day. Oh, it was just horrible. And you know, the rats around this area, like they're not like little guys, they're like monsters yeah that was pretty rough i was like nobody prepared me for this in business ownership but here's so funny the things behind the curtain that the clients (laughs) clients don't see (laughs) awesome well thank you so much for sharing uh we're going to get you back on the show and have that conversation uh about you know different generational differences and uh but until then uh i just want to say thanks again thanks for having me all right take care